Hello, everyone. What an absolute pleasure to be here. And thank you, Microsoft Startups, for having me. So I have been in the people space for about two decades. Um, uh, you know, the people part of uh, building your startup is probably the hardest thing you're going to do. It's not your MVP. Um, it's not getting your first customer. It's actually going to be getting this first 50 right. So when you scale, you have really cemented culture. Um, so we're going to spend the next 15 minutes talking about um, some of my experiences in this space. Um, you know, I was the former uh, head of people at Karim, the ride hailing app. I also have a foundation in this space. And of course, now I'm just like you scaling my startup Gleek in this space. So let's get started. Okay, so why the first 50? Um, we're talking about. So, you know, the first 50, you know, kind of goes back to even history, you know, uh, tribes, you know, uh, before all this technology existed, that's where you can actually, you know, you have a controlled environment. And if you do your first 50 right, I promise you, um, you can then go to 200, 500 and become a unicorn. And that those first 50 will be um, your influencers of culture. It's going to be very, you know, like a virus, the right culture you have set in the organization and the right behaviors in your organization. Um, so getting that right is really, really, really critical. So let's start with um, in getting this first 50 right. Um, you know, probably the hardest thing you're going to have to do as a founder, because many of you as founders are very passionate about what you're doing. Um, and knowing why people are in your company is absolutely crucial. So that pyramid there, it's something like the Maslow hierarchy of needs. If you're not familiar with it, it is absolutely fine. It's in the psychology, a term, and it basically says, and, and there is no judgment, by the way, where you stand on this Maslow hierarchy of need, your employees. At the very baseline in Maslow hierarchy of needs are people who are in your company because it's a job. It means that they are there Monday to Friday, nine to five. They can't wait till it's the weekend. On Sundays they go, shucks, I can't believe it's Monday. Um, and they're really being responsible adults, but they're only there until somebody else pays them more to go somewhere else. People who have a job uh, as I said, nothing is wrong with that, but they need to have very solid skills. So it means while they're there from nine to five, they are absolutely delivering value to you within that time period, right? That's why we have a whole kind of gig economy out there right now. If you look at the gig economy that's out there right now, you know, these are people with skills, right? They can come, they deliver, um, um, and you can measure that. The next level um, above that are people who are looking for belonging and esteem, and they're really building a career. Um, they will work extra hours, um, but they are passing through, right? You are a stepping stone to some other trajectory that they have. Those are the people who genuinely you want to, um, and what keeps them engaged is you know being able to um, highlight them within groups and networks right um, you can invest in their learning and development certifications that type of thing right and that's the career trajectory of uh, why people are in your company and the third level which is the highest level um, and i'm going to give you a little caveat for this level uh, because sometimes we mistake it for something else this is calling and this is when somebody is truly aligned the reason why they're here in this world is because it's exactly why you're building what you're building. And somehow they found you and they're very aligned to it. Um, uh, they will work over and beyond. Um, it's, you know, it's that level in Maslow hierarchy of needs called self-actualization and transcendence. However, don't mistake someone just having passion uh, and not having skills to be at this level in calling. Right. Um, you know, I think the biggest mistake we say to people is follow your passion. Following your passion is great if you actually have a strength in the area of your passion. 
then in that way, they have something to give to your business. Just having a passion about something and not having skills and a strength in it, that's a hobby. So make sure you recognize the difference, right? In terms of where your people are um, in their journey with you. Another common mistake we make as startup founders, I mean, because we don't have a lot of resources, I mean, let's face it, um, you know, most of us are bootstrapping or on our first rounds and, you know, until you really kind of get to a series A, um, you're asking people to do all kinds of stuff and wear all kinds of roles, you know, moving them around, you know, um, and we make the common mistake of going, we're family. Um, you're not family. Right. You know, family, um, uh, there are a lot of things that you tolerate with family that you don't with your team members. You are actually playing a sport. Right. So this is how I explain it to my team. We're here. We are a sports team and we're in it to win. Everybody has a role in that sports team. Um, and when it becomes very clear, everybody has a role in that sports team. It means everybody needs to have a different skill set. Some might be all rounders. If you're, you know, I haven't seen cricket, but I have a lot of cricket guys on my team. And some of them go, I'm an all rounder. Some of them might be the batsmen. Some of them might be the bowlers. But everything needs to be synchronized in terms of that team in order to actually win, you know, if you're in it to win it. So not family. Big mistake. Now, how do you... Um, you know, when I say to you, everybody needs to know what their role and their strengths are in this team. Sadly, most people don't know what their actual strengths are. They don't know, uh, particularly if you have a young workforce. And in most startups, we do have a young workforce. So you're going to, I think one of the most important investments you're going to make is going to be in understanding everyone's skills and their competency and their behaviors. This is not a personality test, guys. This is actually one of the things that we do here at Gleek. It's what are the behaviors driving top and bottom performers of your organization? And you might think you know what it is, and you might think and say, oh, here are the things that we want to be our culture. But if you don't have behaviors and you don't know what they are and who has it and whether that's actually aligned to performance in your company or not, um, you're not going to actually win the match, right? You know, every baseball player has a stats card. And on that stats card, you have you know where they stand. And that's exactly what you have to do with your team members. And that is constantly moving and shifting. And that's why I say to you, it's not a personality test. That's one and done. We are not one and done. Many of your people on your team within three months, six months, just based on exposure, are going to be entirely different people entirely different behaviors. So being able to monitor what are the behaviors driving performance in your organization and what is not driving performance in your organization is critical. It's also critical on where you're going to spend your money in training and development. So it makes absolutely zero sense to spend money on check the box, training and development. You know, oh, my salespeople need sales training. Yes, but in what behavior do they need sales training? And I'll give you an example. You know, one of our clients was Prada USA and immediately they, you know, they came to us and they said, well, our people need to be persuasive and our people need to uh, be thinking on their feet and they need to be extroverted. And then we actually did this for them. And guess what? They're a rule following organization, very process driven. And guess what? The behavior is that the top performers, people selling the most were rule following, conflict resolution and stress management. You need to know this in your organization, in terms of your team. And the reason why you know, need to know this is it's going to become very apparent very quickly to you, something called Pareto's rule. Um, if I were to say to you, do you know who your top performers are? You all know who they are. And Pareto's rule, Pareto was an economist, an Italian economist who, you know, a really simple rule. Um, way back, you know, he was a farmer. And he noticed that, you know, 20% um, uh, of the, the seeds planted yielded over 80% of, you know, really, that really healthy crop. And it's the same thing if you take, you know, he kind of looked across the board at that time and said, wait a minute, it's the same thing in every single sector, right? It's the same thing in stocks, you know, 20% of the companies are, you know, giving 80% of the returns. It's the same thing. Uh, with people in your organization also. 20% of your people, if you're lucky, uh, because in some instances it's it's less than that, are yielding about 80% of whether it be revenues, depending on the type of uh, uh, businesses you're in, whether it's impact. Um, know who they are. Know what the competencies are that's driving in the behavior and pay them on equally. Meaning, 
you pay them more than anybody else. You know, I have a perfect example of this. You know, I had a, um, a young student right out of university, um, American University of Sharjah started with me about a year ago, you know, started part time uh, within three months. Uh, she got a 400% raise and went on to kind of lead um, Expo 2020, which is one of our projects um, uh, that we're powering. Um, very quickly, I was able to spot what it is the skills were, what it is the competencies were, how different, uh, and that she can drive 80% of what was happening within the organization. And I moved her immediately up to the top. Don't get stuck, which we all do as startups going... This is what a level one looks like. And this is what a level two looks like. And this is what a level three employee looks like. And after six months, you have a review or one year, whatever that time period is. And then you can graduate into that other level. Um, while that might work for um, the mid layer, the career layer um, of your organization, there are going to be some individuals that are your high potentials. You bypassed all of that and you put them where they belong right away. And the same thing goes with demoting people. Um, you know, so I've actually demoted um, in the last six months, um, people who came in saying I'm at a level three or four, their experience showed they were a level three or four, but within our company uh, culture, very quickly within six months, I saw that they were operating at a level three or a level two, had a very transparent conversation with them about it, demoted them, um, agreed to pay for them to get upskilled in the area where they had a lack and they could have chosen to say yes or no, I'm going to stay or not. And yes, if you invest in me, I agreed also that once as you get back up to speed by the end of the year, you will get back to that compensation level you came in at. So don't ever be afraid I know it's hard out there right now. I mean, to recruit and, you know, uh, particularly if you're in tech like myself, um, you know, it's so darn hard to find brilliant people. But in that first 50, as I said to you, if you do it right, and, you know, I've been in big organizations before with, you know, 200, 300, 500 employees, you know, undoing bad culture and undoing bad first set of hires um, you don't want to be in that place when you're scaling an organization. You just don't want to be in that place. So spend the time doing that first group right. You're also going to come to the realization as you're doing this, some people are just not investable. I don't know if investable is a word, but let's make it a word here today. I think you know what that means. Um, and here's what I mean by that, right? There are four big clusters um, when I look at individuals and I look at gaps um, uh, with my team. Either they don't have the skills, either they don't have the knowledge, they don't uh, have motivation, or there is something from their culture and their environment that's impacting in terms of performance. And when you look at those, sometimes there's some of these things you can fix and some of these things might not be fixable. And let me give you an example. So skills, I think it's a fairly simple one. Some of the skills, particularly hard skills, some of the soft skills, which is the area, you know, I'm in as the founder of Gleek is harder because some of the habits of soft skills, bad habits come from culture and environment. Um, and because, you know, I think it, it's harder now even uh, than before, because when people are in an office environment, you're able to control the environment. Because most of us are working from home still, you don't know their home environment. You don't know the dynamics with them, with their family members, extended family members living under the same roof, etc. And sometimes it's really difficult in the soft skills um, uh, uh, which, it, it, you know, generally would not be the case without practice, but because it's tied so closely with environment right now, um, it could be a potential issue. So uh, cut the cord really quick for those that are not investable. You know, I think very often we, we, we should be hiring, taking longer to hire and fire fast. And I think we do the very opposite, particularly um, in the economy that we are right now. Um, I encourage you not to, because keeping a bad hire, it's like a virus infecting everybody else on the team and in terms of the company, and you need to be able to cut that quickly. 
Um, the next thing in terms of your workforce, you know, I'm sure many of you have already invested in employee engagement tools and, you know, um, how do I keep people engaged and happy and I'm doing surveys. It is not your responsibility to keep your employee happy. I actually create a whole onboarding session on this. And for those of you who would like to get a copy of this, please, you know, uh, you can go ahead and uh, uh, message me on LinkedIn. I'm more than happy to share with you our internal Gleek onboarding deck. Um, you know, on the onboarding deck, I'm very clear to employees. And it's really simple. Happiness is an inside job and it feels really good. And you need to take responsibility of your own happiness. And, you know, there's a wonderful, you know, framework for this, you know, you have them come up with three or five questions um, that they need to ask and answer on a daily basis, rating themselves from one to 10. And you, they can buddy up on doing this. And, you know, every week they're keeping tallies on this. And, you know, one of the simple ones is did I do my best today to build positive relationships. So let's assume your issue is um, you're, you, you don't, you're having issues, let's say with your managers or your bosses. And you ask a simple question, did I do my best today to manage my relationship with my manager or my boss and rate yourself from one to 10? If your issue is communication, did I do my best today to communicate with all stakeholders, rate yourself from one to 10? Did I do my best today to you know, progress towards a goal? When you make employees responsible for their own happiness, it's a game changer. Because then the conversations become different. It is not your duty and your obligation um, to keep anyone happy. And then, you know, uh, very last um, is uh, you're going to mess up. You know, I don't know about you guys, but for me, you know, uh, scaling a startup is the hardest thing I've ever done. Literally, I wake up every day, one in courage, one in fear, going, holy crap. Um, and you're going to, I'm not going to say the bad word, mess up over and over. And you're going to upset your team often. And it's okay. Vulnerability is a strength. Um, and what I do have to say is know your language of love and know your team members language of love because you're going to have to have to hang on on those on the bad days. So languages of love, they're love languages for the workplace. There are five words of affirmation. So for example, for me, I love words of affirmation. I love feedback. I love you telling me thank you. I love feeling appreciated with words. Um, physical touch. I mean, we have to be careful about that in the workplace, but I'm also a hugger, right? So when I do get the opportunity to see my employees, I hug them. Uh, receiving gifts. You have employees and even yourself might like receiving little tokens, quality time, you're going to have some employees that to show them appreciation, they want to have a two minute coffee with you or spend some time alone with you, right? That's quality time and some like acts of service, you know, let me help you do that. Know yours. And don't ever be afraid as a founder to say to your team and your employees, this is how I feel appreciated, because it's darn hard leading an organization. And you also need words of, you're only human yourself. And I think most of the times our teams forget that. And you also need uh, words of affirmation yourself. So um, uh, please, you know, note what yours is. I want to thank you wholeheartedly for um, spending this time. I hope um, uh, this was helpful to all of you. As I said, reach out to me if um, there's anything I can do to help you and your startups. And I look forward now to seeing any of your questions. Okay, Sally Ann, thank you for an absolutely incredible session. We're seeing a huge amount of engagement in the chat, and we have uh, eight minutes for questions. So I'm trying, yeah. going to try and get through as many as we can. Perfect. But that was really fantastic. Thank you for your insights. Thank and you your very questions. much. So the first question we have is: Before building your first team, how do you build yourself as a team lead? Uh, Self-awareness. So uh, the first thing you have to do is put a mirror to yourself. You better know, like, um, first of all, know your strengths and what it is you're bringing to the table, right? Start there. Don't look at your gaps. Know exactly what you can own as your strengths. And sometimes it's not in the area of your startup. You know, like I don't come with a tech background. I'm running a tech company, but I have strong people, you know, people whispering skills. So know that strength and then be very conscious of your blind spots and your hidden areas, because that's how you're going to start hiring. Um, in terms of your team, right? You first start to cover blind spots, hidden areas in your team. So know yourself. That's that's where you start, Noor. Um, okay, so now we have a follow-on question that builds on that. 
Okay, because I think knowing your blind spots and hiring to complement you as a founder is a really interesting concept. So what, in your opinion, if any, are the must have skills for your first team versus mm -hmm. the sort of nice to have skills? Or is that super subjective depending on you and your company? I think starting off for most startups before you get to a series A level where you've kind of figured stuff out is many members, many of your initial hires are going to be all rounders as you're trying to figure stuff out. Now, if you know, going into your startup, let's say you absolutely know you come with years of experience. I'm going into deep tech. I mean, clearly then you need people in that particular space. If you are truly iterating and you're still trying to figure stuff out, having people with a wide array of skills, um, you know, which is kind of what I did at Gleek, um, really helped. However, those individuals that got me from zero to one are not the individuals who are going to get me from one to 100. So just be aware of that, depending on where you are. Now I need to be able to get people who have, who can go deep within particular layers that we've now figured out some stuff. So Noor, it depends where you are in the process. Yes. Um, I think one of the ideas that I love the most is that a startup almost needs three different teams depending on where they are in the journey. And sometimes people can make that transition from building to operating to scaling. And sometimes those people can't, right? Um, so let me ask you a, a somewhat difficult question, right? Um, so we spoke about the sort of hierarchy of needs, yeah? Mm -hmm. um, going from job to calling. Do sure. you think, Sal, that there's a way to upgrade potentially very talented employees um, from people who are showing up because it's a job to people who are showing up as a calling? Do you want to? I'm going to okay. throw that question right back at you, right? Because there are people that um, just the way that they're built, right? They're built yeah. that um, I work to just cover you know, my bills. And outside of that, I'm a DJ or I'm a whatever that is. But when they show up, they're like bloody Picasso with their skills. And I actually have great respect for people like that. A lot of times people who are have jobs and really highly skilled, they perform way better um, than, so not because you're in your calling. That's remember when I said to you calling, yeah. you know, calling is tricky. That's because, cool competence, right? Yeah, right. There are many people, particularly as a founder, and it's stroking your ego in many ways, where they come and they're like, I love what you're doing. And, you know, <laughs> I love this space. And, you know, it's really stroking your ego, having them around yeah. you. And then all of a sudden they don't have the skills, right? It's a very different thing. But they're not exactly uh, what the company needs at that point of the trajectory. I, I love absolutely, that. Absolutely. Um, absolutely. Absolutely. We have a time for two more minutes and we just keep getting questions, which I think is testament to how brilliant the insights are. Yeah. Um, can you just touch on, because we got a question around ESOP, yeah? Is how do you oh. split your equity potentially with a co-founder, but also I think relevant to ask about your employees? Um, sure. So where, how do you think about that self? So, I mean, there's a standard rule and just remember you, you can create what you want, right? So this is the first thing uh, I think many founders forget. However, with, if you're going to be raising and you're going to have investors, you know, there is a standard, you're putting aside 15%, up to 15% for the employees as part of an ESOP uh, plan. In terms of your founders or your co-founders, it really all depends, right? You know, so um, at the Y Combinator, just to give you an example, if you've ever tried to apply for the Y Combinator, they don't consider anyone really having skin in the game unless they have more than 15% of your company, right? There are a mm -hmm. couple of them in there that says 50% because then I know they're committed. So there is no, you know, a uh, hard rule. You know, I mean, one of the things... Um, Uh, uh, even creative we've gotten into um, at our companies, we have this incredible mentor community that's helping us build product and we're setting aside 15% in our version of MSOP um, uh, as they're helping us build a company. So mm -hmm. I think you really need to decide, do you fit kind of the mold of um, I'm going to have investors, I need to take the traditional point of view, it's about 15%, um, or I'm going to create something that suits 
really the niche of my organization and my needs. Mm -hmm. um, so again, it's very fluid, that that response, Noor. Sal, I'm going to try and squeeze in one more question just sure. because I'm being greedy. We just have two minutes left. But assume sure. you, the founder, have made a mistake, okay? Um, and you hired somebody and you maybe see a different kind of trajectory for them than the one that you hired them for, or you, yeah. you want to shift them around, not necessarily move them um, out of your organization. How would you go about managing that with the employee? Okay, so that's not a difficult conversation. I do it all the time, all okay. the time. So share, I mean, the, share the pearls of wisdom, please. <laughs> <laughs> um, and here's the reason why, particularly if you're hiring a young workforce, newer. They don't know what their strength is yet. And, um, and and you actually spot a strength in them and they came in in one department and you say, wait a minute, you're actually not marketing your finance. Um, you know, sometimes it's, a, it's as wide as that. Um, and you then kind of dig a little deeper and you look at their analytical skills and you look at, oh yeah, they did have some finance classes and you, you hand lead them through that particular journey because sometimes who we think we are and who we are and the value we have in a business is very very different in a startup i think as a founder you owe it to your team to once is you're self-aware about that in yourself you're able you can't recognize in others what you don't recognize in yourself mm -hmm. um, and once as you spot that you know it's a really simple thing is you have a strength and it can serve the business in that area um, uh, uh, that's really all that matters. Sal, beautiful notes to end on. Thank you yes. so much for a brilliant session. If anyone wants to connect with Sally Ann, she is abundantly generous with her time um, and her experience. I think you can just connect with her directly on LinkedIn. Um, she's tagged in the event. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Thank you. And for all the founders out there, you know, sending you all really good vibes. Okay. Bye. Uh, bye. Uh, next up, we have our very own Roberto Croci, who is my manager and also the MD of Microsoft for Startups, Middle East and Africa. Um, Sally Ann was talking about building your first team, right? From zero to 50 employees. But what happens when you're trying to go beyond that? How do you maintain your culture, whether you're talking about virtually, remotely, um, as you're scaling quickly? And so it is also my absolute pleasure to welcome on board uh, to the stage, virtual stage, uh, Roberto, who will be talking about how to maintain your culture as you're growing fast.